The following program is brought to you in part by the film Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace. Welcome to another Leon China Report. We have a really eclectic and exciting show tonight. I'm CEO of the uh, One Voice Movement Foundation and CEO of PeaceWorks, which is a private corporation doing business in Palestine and Israel. Yeah. I was a U.S. ambassador to Morocco. Well, I was raised in the Middle East. Uh, my background is that I spent my formative years growing up in Israel, Egypt, Jordan, and Lebanon. My father was a hotel interior designer, designing hotels in the Middle East. And my mother had made Aliyah to Israel in 1959 after my f first father passed away. And so uh, I spent almost eight years growing up in the Middle East. I have visited every Middle East country at one time or another except one, and that's Yemen. I can tell you that I was also the first Jewish ambassador to an Arab country from the United States. So I've had the uh, Shall we say, my religion has been a forthright uh, claim of affection and conviction for me in spite of all of my travels. I happened to meet the founder of One Voice by accident through a mutual friend in Texas who, had inf who briefed me on One Voice, who had been a counsel to Daniel Lebetsky, who is the founder of One Voice. Daniel is the entrepreneurial founder of the Kind Healthy Snack Food Bar Company. But his parents are Holocaust survivors. And he was raised in Mexico because his family couldn't make it into the United States during, at, the, uh, during the, at the beginning of World War II. So Daniel was raised in Mexico and then came to the United States and has pursued a single-minded conviction to help forge a durable two-state solution between peace between the Palestinians and Israelis. And so he founded One Voice as a movement to promote training, education, and initiatives among the next generation of Israelis and Palestinians to work as best as they could to convince the leaders of the regions that a two-state negotiated solution is the only reasonable accommodation to a resolution of the conflict. Well, I have the peace, pro peace process industry has, has been in existence for almost 40 years. I worked for President Carter on the Camp David negotiations in 1978 and was on the staff of Ambassador Strauss and Linowitz, who had, in effect, been the first envoys for the post-Camp David Palestinian negotiations. And so how viable it is, I think every day that goes by, particularly at this point in time in the very damaging career of the negotiated two-state solution, the chances for both parties finding the trust and confidence to make the compromises necessary is dissipating rapidly. I, there's no doubt that the settlement enterprise has been a poisonous nail in the coffin of a negotiated agreement in order to produce a viable Palestinian state. Uh, I, have, I, I think both Palestinians and Israelis understand that there are certain settlements that will in any negotiated agreement become part of Israel in exchange for land swaps. But the unremitted uh, announcements of continued settlements by the Netanyahu regime is the equivalent of handing poison to the negotiators. All it does is undermine the trust and confidence that the parties have. And comparably, on the Palestinian side, the Palestinians fail to recognize the fact that there are issues of enormous consequence to the Israeli public. And the Palestinians have a tendency to put issues on the table without understanding, in some respects, how those issues and how they deal with them cause enormous consternation to Israelis. That's one of the reasons why the United States has been an essential party to these negotiations, because 
left to their own devices, they may have, the parties may have negotiated Oslo, but look where we are 20 years later since Oslo. Yeah, I'm afraid that the attitude, the Arafat, uh, shall we say, the, the, the Arafat curse uh, on these negotiations has unfortunately endured. It has always been my view that in order to prepare the negotiation table in a way that is going to bring the not only the parties to an, an amicable resolution, but their populations. You've got to stand up in front of each population and say, vital compromises are necessary. And these compromises mean that we cannot deliver, whether it's the Israelis or Palestinians, 100% of what we promised you. The Palestinians, in many respects, have failed to do the adequate public diplomacy necessary to convince the Palestinian population that painful compromises are necessary. Arafat promised the sun and the moon to the Palestinians, and at Camp David, he was promised the moon and not the sun. But he didn't have the courage to go back before the Palestinian people and say to them with conviction and with leadership that I am here to offer you maybe 90 or 80 percent of what I committed to do, which is a much better agreement than a zero agreement. He never did that. And for that reason alone, he's created a pattern in which subsequent Palestinian leaders have also not been willing to go and make, make the statements before the Palestinian people. It's interesting enough, President Abbas said before 400 Israelis who went to meet with him at the Makata, organized by One Voice, that he, quote, has no intention of flooding Israel with refugees. Now, that was a very important statement to say to Israelis. In other words, he was rejecting the right of return. Why is he not prepared to go in front of his own people and say it's important for Israelis to have some comfort level and understanding that we are not going to be able, and we certainly cannot, somehow force on Israel all of the Palestinians who fled and their generations that have survived them in order to reach an agreement. That's the type of conviction and statements that's missing from uh, Palestinian leadership to reassure and in effect to tell their own people, you want an agreement, it's going to require you to make that. And you know what? Most of them know that. The ones who don't are living in the refugee camp still. And that's the problem is that you have Palestinians who still believe that they're going to return to their homes in Israel and who are in refugee camps. And then you have a vast majority of West Bankers who understand they're not going to ever go back. But these refugees are the big problem. And remember, Arafat never wanted to clean out those refugee camps and give them permanent homes anywhere. And likewise, uh, it's been very hard, other than Prime Minister Rabin, for any Israeli leader to go in front of the Israeli people and say, we are going to have to make painful compromises on issues that are going to be painful to the Israelis, such as the removal of settlers from the settlements. I mean, that's, a, that, that's something that uh, I have never heard Prime Minister Netanyahu state in the Knesset. Well, there's no doubt that when we say the right wing, the extremist right wing, I mean, the, the uh, Israel Beitenu party, the, the, led by Naftali Bennett, and some of the more extremist elements of the Likud party have clearly no desire, incentive, or ideological goal to negotiate a two-state solution with the Palestinians. They are determined to hold on to the West Bank. And to the extent that any negotiation occurs, it's on their terms, which is in effect to maintain Israel, Israeli control over the West Bank. Uh, and in effect, more or less, offer the Palestinians who live there some sort of economic uh, equilibrium rather than a solution, a solution to a state they could call their own. I think that Abbas clearly understands that well, on the one hand he wants Palestinian uni unity, on the other hand he doesn't want Palestinian unity at the cost of what he essentially hopes for despite the collapse of these negotiations, which is a negotiated agreement with the Israelis. I, I am fundamentally convinced that Abbas is not given enough credit by the Israeli government 
for many of the statements and initiatives that he undertook during these negotiations to reach out to Israelis. It was as if Netanyahu and, and his government uh, pretended as if nothing that Abbas said should be amplified and validated by his regime. It's not as if Netanyahu has control over his own coalition. He doesn't. I think the negotiations prove that he's a victim of his own coalition rather than the leader of his own coalition. Number two, uh, I don't think he really has come to terms himself with the compromises that are necessary in order to forge a two-state negotiation consistent with terms of final status negotiations that require severe compromise, which ultimately would in effect blow up, literally, uh, when I say figuratively, blow up his coalition. Uh, third, I don't think that Mr. Netanyahu has really taken a look beyond the immediate horizons of his office to see the dangers that are lurking in the Middle East and the dangers that are lurking to Israel in the absence of a negotiation. I think he has a view that it's more or less Israel is a castle and has high walls and can survive any attack on it and I think that that's a, a very dangerous fiction to fall into. Well, the dangers emerge from a variety of factors. After all, the conflict with the Palestinians has been managed to be con remain a secular, uh, a secular, more or less a secular conflict. That is, it's a f nationalism challenge by the Palestinians to g obtain a, a, a Palestinian state. Uh, secondly, I think also that the dangers from de an unstable Jordan as a result of events in uh, the region, uh, an unstable Lebanon, the capacity for Hezbollah to continue to grow. It's not as if a resolution of the Palestinian conflict is in, a, in effect the precondition to resolving all of Israelis, all of Israel's security challenges. It is not. I don't buy that anymore. I used to buy that, but I don't buy that anymore. What I buy now is that the demographic threat to Israel is something that the Israelis can easily, in their minds, push aside. But it eventually, like anything else, it's like a fire. You know, it can catch, it starts to grow and grow and grow. And eventually results in a, the very Zionist dream being challenged. And that's not what my family uh, made Aliyah to Israel for. And that's not what I think the vast majority of Israelis want which is to descend into a chaotic binational state where the dream of a Jewish state that is able to fulfill the visions of, of Zionism is fulfilled. And I think that the opponents of a two-state solution are playing with the essential foundation of Israel's very existence. Well, Marwan Barghouti is a very interesting man who's currently held in prison. Uh, he is someone that many Palestinians and Israelis talk about as the successor to President Abbas. Uh, he's well known to the Israelis, and I understand he speaks Hebrew, and I understand also that he's someone who understands the importance of a negotiated agreement with the Israelis. But his celebrity status uh, could very well evaporate if he's released from prison and, and, and he falls into the very cauldron of this current Palestinian internal rivalries that are gripping Palestine right now. Is he the Nelson Mandela or the, uh, in, uh, uh, the Gandhi to, is, to, to the Palestinians and is someone who they can see as a future leader? I don't think any of us really know the answer to that. His name is bandied about far too frequently without, I think, understanding that there are a lot of a lot of levels of concern over exactly what he would do if he were released at this point. I think too many people are imputing too much hope and expectation. Unfortunately, a lot of Palestinians who were released had a lot of Israeli blood on their hands. And you know, the definition of too much to me, let's put it this way, one drop is too much. But that doesn't mean that there hasn't been blood on both sides' hands. And let's also understand that 
uh, there has been significant acts of Israeli terrorism committed against Palestinians in the last several years. People have been abducted, people have been shot by these so-called uh, paycheck, I forget the exact phrase, these, these people who extract retribution on innocent Palestinian Israeli families and on, on Palestinian families for acts that were committed by other Palestinians against settlers. It's as reprehensible an acts of terrorism as any acts of terrorism that are being committed uh, by Palestinians. And let's understand that those acts are occurring. I think the question ultimately is uh, you're going to have an election in Palestine, assuming there's an election in Palestine. I don't think we know for certain yet. I think the Palestinians have to decide when that election occurs what that means for the purposes of their future going forward. And in Israel, with the, talk, with the negotiations collapse, the question is how long will this coalition survive? It's not due f to be elected or face election again until 2017. There's a lot of people in Israel who think the coalition will not last that long. The next election in Israel has got to be about the settlement enterprise and about the nature of the conflict and the future of Israel. It cannot be what Mr. Netanyahu wants it to be, which is an election solely about security and fear, and not about the challenges that Israel faces in the absence of a negotiated agreement. That's, I think, where the future of a two-state solution will ultimately be decided in the next Israeli election. The Israelis vote on security, but, but, Let's also understand that there was an election that was not on security. The last election was not necessarily on security. There were 25 Knesset seats that were won by uh, Yeshatid and Hat Nuwa, and they were not won on security. And there were many votes that were cast for other seats that were not on security. And I don't think that anyone can assume that shall we say, the right-wing extremists have a monopoly on political and electoral power right now in Israel. There's a lot of Israelis who may have voted for Likud in the past, who, have, who are increasingly dissatisfied with the extremist rhetoric that's coming out of the right-wing in Israel insofar as Israel's long-term interests and long-term goals. And I think Israelis are, shall we say, are going to have to wake up to the reality of what they're going to face in the next election. Uh, there's no telling how this is all going to play out. Is the status quo tenable and will it continue so that in the end you have a non-negotiated two-state solution where both parties take acts and more or less settle into an unacceptably ambiguous status quo where there's no resolution of the key final status issues? That's a chance. But it depends on how long the Palestinians are prepared to deal with that status quo. It may be comfortable for the Israelis to believe that that's durable. I don't think that it's, a, it's durable, and I don't think the Palestinians will put up with it. There's got to be a next, there's got to be a generational change here. Uh, I think everybody in Palestine is trying to figure out who, if anyone, is going to succeed him. He's, uh, President Abbas has has done everything he could to prevent uh, Mahmoud Dahlan from uh, being able to ascend to a position of influence. But you have uh, Jabril Rajoub and others who are sitting and who are waiting for the opportunity to seize the powerful control of Fatah. Um, it remains to be seen. Um, but I think that there's got to be a generational change. But I also understand in my many meetings and comments and discussions with President Abbas, that he would have liked to have reached an accommodation with the Israelis. That personally, you know, he sent his grandchildren to seize a peace camp. And he came to realize the, the personal narrative that has been missing, except for the next generation of Palestinians who have served in Israeli prisons serve sentences and, and therefore have come to know Israelis. The biggest problem right now is as a result of the security barrier, neither party really knows each other anymore. There's very little interaction between the two sides.
I think still the polls still suggest that there are silent majorities on both sides that if they had the right leaders would be wanting to be led to the promised land. Welcome to another Leon China Report. Today we are sitting in the Knesset. We're talking with an old friend, Matan Vilnai. Remember we did a profile on him about two, two and a half years ago and the thing we noticed mostly about him aside from his stupid political instincts was the fact that he sounded and looked like Yitzhak Rabin. And most of you wrote in and said, yes, we were correct. Matan is now running for the chairmanship of the Labor Party. It's a five-man race. He's also a member of the uh, cabinet, uh, the government. Uh, he's a minister without portfolio, dealing a lot with the disengagement problem. And uh, we're going to grill him a little bit about what's going on in the Labor Party and the disengagement. Matan, welcome to our show. Thank you. And you know, you still look like it's like Robin and sound <laughs> like him. You haven't changed a bit. <laughs> Although it was two years ago, more than two. Like two years ago. Two years ago, yeah. Two so since ago. then you became a grandfather. Yeah, since then I'm a grandfather. Life goes on. Yeah. Put this all together for me today, what's going on, Matan? You got disengagement coming up, you got the crisis. Yesterday there was a bomb in Netanya. Uh, where do you go? How is this, how is this going to happen? Tell us. We have to think about the vision. And my vision, and I believe that this vision, the vision of most of the Israelis, is to have a Jewish democratic state in the area of Eretz Israel. This is, for me, the deep meaning of the Jewish state, of Israel. And the moment that you understand it, it's obvious that we must disengage ourselves from the Palestinians. We must separate ourselves from the Palestinians. And as a military man, I know that there is only one way. First of all, we have to fight terror. The terror that you mentioned that happened just yesterday in Netanya of the Islamic Jihad is a typical radical Muslim terror, like Al-Qaeda, like what's happened last week in, in London. This terror, you can only fight them. You can't talk with them. They are there in school of thought of radical Muslims. They are not the Muslims, they are radical Muslims. You can't speak with them, you can't have treaties with them, nothing. You have to fight them till the end of the days. But at the same time, you have to understand that fighting terror is not good enough. So you have to fight him. According to the old Jewish say, Abalo Gehash Kemlo Go, the one that come to kill you, you have to kill first. But you understand that it's not a solution. And therefore, you have to separate from the Palestinians. If you are not going to separate from them, you are not going to be democratic. Or we are not going to be Jewish. Because if you will be mixed with them, Palestinians and Jews together, it's only a matter of time that they will be the majority. It's a very short time. And it will not be a Jewish state. Or will be a citizen criteria A like us, and citizen Qatariya be the Palestinians, I'm not going to live in a state like this. So it's obvious that we must separate from the Palestinians. So this is a very dramatic time in the state of Israel. It's very important. And, I, and this, is the right, this is the right moment to do it. I heard uh, Mofaz, the defense minister, yesterday and uh, in a special ceremony, but he really took that time to talk to a bunch of soldiers and tell him this is the time to unite, this is the Israeli Defense Forces, no split-offs, no, no crying about policy, no politics. No auto refusal. No auto refusal. Is that a real problem in the Army today? I don't believe so. It's a problem in section, in one section in the Israeli society, and it's a problem from the soldiers that are coming from this section. It's not going to be a war between brothers, it's not going to be a civil war. It's not going to be a national trauma. It's a trauma to a very minor group in our society. It's not the whole society. It's not half of the society. It's a minor group that for them it's a trauma. They can put the forces all over. I'm speaking about civil civilians, about demonstrations, something like this, not more than that, of 10,000s of people. But it's only 10,000 of people. It's not millions. It's not hundreds of thousands. And therefore, 
and they understand it very well. And the soldiers, they are at the end part of the IDF, and we are not going to destroy the IDF because of these people. And the soldiers and the young officers, and they understand this. Although we'll be here and there are people that will say we can do it, but not hundreds, not thousands. Will be minor uh, uh, f a phenomena of people like this, but not more. And I'm sure that at the end, the army discipline, the basic understanding that the most important thing in Israel is the army. It's not the army as you know as America. It's a civil army. It's a civil army. It's a machine that can, it's it's the best machine in our society in order to promote people from all the ranks to be generals, to be part of the, of the army, it's very important, and they're not going to disobey, I'm sure about it. Also, we'll be here and there, but not a phenomenon. I tend to agree with you, and I've been scouting the country now for three weeks, and I also, everybody talked, I went to the Maccabea Games, the opening ceremony, Everybody thought there'd be a big protest with orange bands, etc. There was nothing. Arak Sharon came, Katsav came, probably a lot of generals. Everybody came, and there was no incident whatsoever. So I think the American media, and it's a media event. People, you have 3,000 media people uh, coming down to Gush Katif to follow this thing. And I know from following uh, President Clinton, I was uh, on the White House press tours many times, Sometimes when the media have nothing to do, they talk to each other and they stimulate problems. Absolutely. So, so they take the cameras and they look at a man maybe with a kippah who's running around with a flag and they say this is what's going on in Israel and you see it in the Herald Tribune and God knows what's happening. But I think what Matan is saying, and he's a deputy chief of staff of the Israeli Defense Forces, I'm smelling with my American nose and, and the fact that I've been here many times and was a a party to uh, Camp David one where uh, Yamit was evacuated and I know that there was a lot of noise about that before you were born Matan but uh, we uh, we thought it would pass okay and I think the Americans can be a little bit more calm about it and uh, and watch the not watch everything the media tells you so Matan uh, there's not much difference between you and Arik Sharon he's allegedly a member of Likud oh. in this case we are on the same boat and the disengagement is very important, therefore I'm in his government. I'm in the unified government only because of this engagement. I don't agree with the socioeconomic uh, plans. I don't agree with the education plans. I agree with one thing, and this is an historical point, and therefore I'm there to support the Prime Minister. And every week now you will realize how important this support is, this support is because of the disengagement, because it's a very crucial moment in our history, in the short history How of How long you know Arak Sharon? <laughs> <laughs> I served... When he was slim? I never saw him slim. Oh. <laughs> I never saw him slim. Okay. Maybe before. <laughs> he was, for me, he was al always, as you say, heavy as a Robust. Yeah, robust, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I served... We commanded the same units. He is older than me, 20 years, something 77. Like so we 16 years between us. And he was a legend in the paratroopers. We commanded the same special uh, unit in the uh, paratrooper brigade. We commanded the same battalion, really? the same brigade, the same division, and the same territorial command. So you know each other pretty well. It was a gap between us. Yeah, but he, but he had he, sentimental feelings absolutely. toward it. And when he served as commander of Sasson Command in the early 70s, I was a battalion commander, his, com his battalion, battalion commander of paratroopers in Gaza Strip. And since then, I know him very well. So it's, it's a generation. It's more than 30 years. It Pretty courageous so what he's doing in a sense, He was very it? courageous. He used to be one of our best generals, but it's not enough to be a politician. But now he behaves according to my best beliefs, what must be done in Israel, not from the social As a patriot. He is a patriot, and I believe that I'm a patriot as well. His understanding of the socio-economic problems is not the same. 
but dealing with the Palestinians now, I'm not sure for the future, I'll, I'll refer to it in a minute, now he is doing the right thing, and therefore I am there. If Gaza, the disagreement from Gaza, will be first and last phase, it will be a disaster. And I'm not going to support it. You need a vision. But if it's first and then it will continue, I'll be there. Now he prefer not to speak about it because he has now the mission to finish this engagement, I can understand it. But the moment after that, if I see no vision, if I see no continuation, I'm not going to win. And this is the difference between me and him. But Tom, when you sit in cabinet meetings on a Sunday morning, you get the feeling that the cabin is with Sharon now or is a lot of dissidence there, especially from his own party? <laughs> Because we are there, he's safe. He's safe. He has now in his government eight labor ministers, and we are eight out of uh, 23, I believe, so something like third, third of the of the government. But other Likud members understand that if they will not support him, he has us, so they prefer to be with him. There is a minor group, a small group of three, four, four ministers. They are against him. They are against him in the government. They are against him in his party. There is no way he could to do. And I'm not sure who is now the Likud leader, because if Sean is going to be uh, elected within Likud party, I'm not sure what will happen. In the public, he is very strong. In the general public, he is very strong. But I'm not sure how strong he is within his ranks. In I, his, think he, I think in he knows party. that. But therefore, the unified government is so important. And there were bigger arguments about the unified government. Now, I believe it's obvious. And every week now we'll see how important it is that we are sitting with them. It's very important. All right, let's talk about parties that seem discombobulated. You're running for the leadership of your party. Let me see if I know who you're running against. Uh, Shimon Perez. Amir Peretz from the Histadrut, who's never been in the government. Uh, he's a, he's no, a no. Knesset member. He's a Knesset member. Uh, Fuad, the former Brigadier General and yeah. uh, Defense Minister, Shimon Peretz. And he was the chairman. And the chairman. Fuad, Fuad was chairman? He was the chairman. Yeah. And, and, then, and then there's you. And me. No, and no, Barak. 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 Yeah. yeah. And Barak. It's like a primary. It's five five talented guys trying to lead the party. Is it, does it get rough between you guys? Uh, here and there. Is it civil? No, no, it's, it's civil, yeah. Better it's than the American Democratic politics. I'm not sure how it's going with the Democrats. I'm an expert on the Democratic expert? politics. I'm not expert it can get very rough. Oh, really? <laughs> very rough. It can get ugly. Yeah, at times, it's very rough, ugly. But we speak with each other. We can sit and talk. And uh, there is no real bad blood. But it's primaries, and you have to fight for your own point, for your own place. When, when is the date? Do we know? It was postponed, I know. It postponed in the last moment, two, exactly two weeks ago, no, two and a half weeks ago, because of problems in the uh, people that joined the party. Membership. Membership. People registered to be members of the party. There were some problems there some kind of corruption, some kind of things, not according to the law. And we stopped it in the last minute because I realized that m the most important thing is to have a clean and a pure party, then to have a mess and to have election on time. And therefore, I was one of the people that promote the, uh, and to postpone the, the elections. It was not easy, <coughs> but we succeed. And now we have to find a new uh, day to do it. There is now the disengagement. Just after that will be all the Jewish festivities along Holidays. October. Uh, Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, Kippur, Sukkot. And then we can do it. I can see the first day that I can say the 1st of November. November. 1st of November, it's the Tuesday, the first Tuesday after Sukkot. But then will be the Memorial Day of Rabin, 
and after the business judgment, no one knows what is going on to what what will be in the political arena in Israel. Maybe it will be a crisis. I'm not sure about it. Maybe it will be new general elections. No one knows about it. So it's complicated. It's very complicated. So Matan, your vision after disengagement, I'm sure you have a vision. You know exactly where you want to go. Yeah. Tell it to us. First of all, we must understand that while fighting terror, and I fought terror all my life, and you know it, I was barely wounded in battlefield, I know what is, what is the meaning of fighting terror, you understand that it's not a solution. This is the most important thing to understand. Sharon understood it only a year and a half ago. Till then, he was sure that by using the IDF effectively, and the IDF is very effective, he is going to win. And he was wrong. I told him for the first time that he is wrong about it. And he was wrong. So we must have a new plan that the disengagement from Gaza is only the first phase of this plan. And I found a word in English for gathering. How you mentioned to gather people, not to gather people, to gather the whole nation into new borders with several blocks in the West Bank, but most of the uh, little location must di disappear from there. We have to go back to the old borders of Israel. We have to go back to the old values of our society. We have to go back to a society with social justice in the society. It's all together. And first of all, we have to go back to the roadmap of President Bush, because the roadmap is the only pr practical plan now in the Middle East. I don't believe with the timetable, but I believe in the main ideas of the roadmap, which means a, a, a Palestinian state alongside Israel. It's not for the Palestinians and for the Israelis, because if not, as I mentioned before, we will have a very deep problem with the Palestinians, because they need to have their own state, and this is my vision. So we have to gather our forces, our people, to new Israel according to our uh, values, according to our strengths, and not to be spread all over. So Mantan, what you're doing is you want them to internalize sort of a new state. What happened was after the Six Day War is everybody thought this is it, we conquered everything, and you were a part of it, I'm sure. And I believe the only person at that time who had the vision to say we're not really conquerors was Abba Ibn, by the way. I spoke to him about it. He said I was a lone wolf, everybody was celebrating, you know. So now what you have to do is take everybody, consolidate them, because you want to have a Jewish state, and demographically it's impossible because of the Arab population is, is very strong. And so it's a huge, huge social problem also. And then you get to take away the fear of people of security. If you have a Palestinian next day, they think they'll throw a rocket over you and, and they're afraid and you're a military guy. No, of guy. course, we must. Everything is from a security point of view. And the uh, ability to defend ourselves and the ability to be the superpower of the Middle East, it's obvious. There is no argument about it. You must be strong. We must keep our forces. We must be the, the strongest state in the Middle East. No argument about it. But in the same time, to have borders that most of the population will be Israelis, more than 80% must be Israel, must be Jews, not Israelis, but Jews, because they are Arab Israelis Israel, as well. Sure. And they are Jews and all, and all, all Christians and all the other. But we must be 80% and more Jews. You know, this year, the first year, that Israel is the biggest Jewish community in the world. Yeah. Bigger, bigger the than the, the, the state, yeah. And it's very important to, to keep us like this. And in order to do it, we must get rid of a local, a small locations in the, in the West Bank. We must get rid of Gaza, of course. And we must be strong in our borders, in the new borders of Israel. And from this point of view, I just start to read a book, it's interesting, just this morning, to read a book about 67. I was then 
a company commander in the power truck. Who wrote the book? Uh, Tom Sege. Who must read it. Yeah, I heard I'm, about it. I'm sure that it's in English as well. Right. He wrote the book many years ago about the Israelis. No, I know Sege. It's, it's Tom Sege. Yeah, it's, uh, you must read it. 67, and there are. <laughs> Uh, he put, I saw uh, pictures of, uh, of our uh, media. There is one uh, note, we freed the whole of Israel. And the other note, we conquer. <laughs> and there is a difference between to free the territories or to conquer the territory. It started just over, just two, two weeks after the war. It started all over. And Eagle alone was strong enough and clever enough to put a plan. As the Yalom plan. Yigal Yalom was the foreign minister and a big, big uh, hero in the uh, of, of the Palmaf, independence war. In the, the independence Palmaf, war. The and, of and all that. I just not, not everybody in my audience would remember. And he came up with the Yalom plan. And, and this Yalom plan, then it was rejected by my party. Now we are fighting <laughs> to reach Yalom plan. It's very important to understand it. Now we are fighting for this. Are you personally satisfied with the first camp, David? With Egypt? Egypt? With it? Oh, of course, of course. You have no problem with it? No problem with it at all. And speaking about the border with the Egyptians in Gaza, what used to call Philadelphia. Right. It's a code, it's a military code, Philadelphia. I am sure. And at the end, they are going to, to discuss it next week. Steinitz is uh, Yuval Steinitz. Steinitz is show. against. He's much against. He's much against Egypt. Period. He is afraid of the Egyptians. He's very afraid. We had big My interview with him. My mother came from Cairo. Your mother? My mother came from. Don't look Cairo. so dark. No, no. She, she came. She, she. Uh, they came from East uh, Europe, somewhere in Romania, I believe, to Egypt because my grandpa that I never saw. He needs to have a weather, a dry weather of the of the desert. So they moved there. She was born in Cairo. I visited Cairo several times, and I saw her place. It's a wonderful place, a villa, in the middle of the diplomatic section of uh, of uh, Cairo. It's Mahdi. And she used to tell, you know, I was a kid in the paratroopers fighting the Egyptians in the attrition war. I commanded several operations deep beyond beyond the, the lines of the of the of the of the Egyptians, and she used to tell me every two or three months that I came home, why are you fighting the Egyptians? <laughs> they are good people. They have nothing with us. And listen carefully. And a, a, a Jewish mother always right. They will be the first state a Arab really? state to have peace with us. She said it in the 70s. Wow. And she said, when uh, Sadat declared that he's going to cross the canal and he's going to pay one million casualties, um, Egyptian casualties, and no problem, he's going to do it. And we laughed. She said, you have to understand it. Really? He's serious. Wow. And he's going to do it. Great. And she was not ever an intelligence officer. Wow. She understood it. She wow. understood it. And I have no problems with the Egyptians because they have their own world their own problems, and they must have peace with us. And the two of us depend on you. On the, on the I think, uh, you know, I was involved in that business, uh, but I think Mubarak, all in all, has done a fairly good job. And uh, I think uh, what I'm he, he's of? a key, by the way. Yeah. He may not be there longer. That's what you're afraid this of. The There's point. fundamentalism this is, in, in Egypt. This is the point. This right. is the point. All right, let's hold for a break, and we'll come right back and continue our conversation with Matan Del Nai. Talk a little bit about the Palestinians, see what he thinks about uh, Mahmoud Abbas and Kiri and that whole group. We'll be right back. We're back. We're talking with Matan Vilnayi, who is running for the chairmanship of the Labour Party. He was deputy commander of the Israeli Defense Forces. He is a member of the cabinet, minister without portfolio, very much for disengagement, and has a vision for the future. He really thinks that the borders should go back to, I guess, 67 borders and keep a Jewish state and uh, the demographics seem to point that uh, he's correct. No, I, I must correct you, and to keep the uh, big blocks of Jewish settlements in, in uh, the West Bank. Oh, okay. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, wider Jerusalem is part of it. Tell me about the wall in Jerusalem. Are you for that today? In the, the wall in Jerusalem is a necessity. There is no other way. Because the main enemy 
of peace is terror. And if you would like to block terror, yeah, to, to stop terror, you have first of all to build a barrier. The separation from the Palestinians part of it. It's a barrier between us and them. It's obvious. When we redeployed from uh, Gaza in 94, according to the Oslo Accord, I was the commander there, and there was a big argument within our headquarters, the IDF headquarters, how the border is going to look like. And I said, a barrier. It's not a border. It's, a, it's not a line. It's a barrier. And it was a big argument. All my friends in the Netherlands were against me because it's very expensive. And Rabin, at the last moment, take, took the decision to build a barrier, what used to call the fence or the wall. And since then, no suicide bomber crossed from Gaza to, to Israel. Not even one. That was yours? Not even one. It's mine. Really, it's mine. Yeah, a lot of credit. And it, it, it was, this was my vision. And I was in those days, I was sure about the Negev and about all the settlements around Gaza, the Kibbutzim and the Moshavim, and the small town, like Zderot. But we saved Tel Aviv, because now they used to cross from Judea and Samaria to Jerusalem and to the middle of Tel Aviv. And therefore, you must build a line all over, including the, great, the big blocks of Israeli settlements in the West Bank, and including Jerusalem. And therefore, the land in Jerusalem is very important. And this will be the basic to any treaty in the future. Can you have a state of Palestine connecting between roads, let's say, Jericho and Gaza? Is that in the plan? I mean, would you connect uh, so you don't interfere at all with the... No, we must, we must build, I believe, a railroad. A railroad. Between uh, Judea and uh, and uh, Gaza Strip, it's obvious. Maybe uh, maybe a you're going to allow them an airport now. I understand in Gaza. They will have an. They used to have an airport. I know. And they will have an airport again, and they will have a seaport as well. And they must understand the terror is acting against their basic uh, beliefs, their basic interest. This is the most important thing. All right, Matan, but. Take us back a little bit. I think yesterday Islamic Jihad, and this is me talking, not you, somehow was brought about by Iran. I think they're involved in this game. I don't know if you agree, but uh, agree, that's, yeah. that's what I think. Yeah. So really you're fighting forces beyond the Palestinians here, aren't you? Of course. Because again, you must understand that the radical Muslims and Iran now is a key player in this case. Right. And the president that they uh, chose now was in a hostage uh, crisis. It's it's a he he was part of the hostage you, crisis. You know, who was part of the hostage. I saw something. You know, who was part of the negotiations about a hostage crisis. He was. One. No, I'm asking you a question. I was involved in that crisis, negotiating for President Carter. I Are remember. Really? Are yeah. you negotiating for President right. Carter? Right. Yes. And he was one of the I heads know. of the groups of, of the military. Right. You are sure about? I'm not saying anything. I don't talk on television, only to you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was a member of the, not a member, I was uh, asked by President Carter to go see uh, Bruno Kreisky. Oh, okay. And at that time, the Palestinian Authority, <coughs> Arafat, was trying to make a deal that he would be able to free the hostages if we recognized uh, you, the Israelis, recognized the PLO. Mm -hmm. And I was sent on a special mission to check that out. Uh -huh. And there was a fellow named Sartawi, he was a cardiologist who was assassinated, a Palestinian uh, leader yeah. in Vienna. And Kreisky pleaded with me to do the deal. I flew here to meet with all you guys, Chief of Staff. Weitzman was Defense Minister. And the conclusion was that Arafat could not deliver. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which mm -hmm. leads me to my next question Abbas, can he deliver? This is the main question. You know him, by the way? Not personally. I know his people. I never met him. I used to meet Arafat uh, when Rabin sent me to speak with him. I know very well the people around the bus, but not himself. Can he deliver or you don't know? I'm sure but one thing. He would like to deliver. I'm not sure that he's strong enough to do it. Is there anybody over there who can, uh, what time? I believe that at the end, 
the young generations, the young Turks of the Palestinians understand it, and they can do it. They can deliver it. It's not easy because the uh, Palestinian society is falling apart and the socio-economic situation is very bad. It's all fevery there, I mean... It, it of never, course, yeah. of course. And therefore it's our problem, it's our interest that they will be stronger because the Islamic Jihad is the enemy of Abbas, of Sharon, of Mubarak, of Bashar Assad, of, the, uh, of Jalal Talabani from Iraq, of uh, Fahed uh, from uh, Saudi Arabia, they are the enemies of all the rulers of the Middle East, not only the Middle East, because the Islamic Jihad is at the end, it's Al-Qaeda, it's the same. And Al-Qaeda are the enemies of the Western world, of the Western culture. What they have done just now in London, uh, September 11, all of us remember it. And this is the new modern uh, war all over the globe. And they are the enemies, when I'm saying they, the radical Muslims, are the enemies of our culture. All right, I know you got to run, but give me a scene of the world now. What's it going to look like, all this Muslim uh, revolution? What do you think? At the end, yeah. the main issue in the, in, the, in the world now, as I see it, is not only the globalization, but it's the feeling of the Muslim world that they are not in the, in the, in the point that they must be. We understand that too. Matan, Thank you. good to see you. Thank you very much.